ACM um, workshop about mobile applications and uh, development. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and introduce what is ACM uh, for those who are not very familiar. Uh, ACM is one of the most reputable um, organizations in the country um, in, the, in the history of computer science. Uh, there, there are two of them very reputable uh, organizations. One is being ACM and one is being IEEE. And uh, being a computer science major, it's good to follow um, at least one of them, if not both, uh, if not possible. So <coughs> these organizations have made an enormous contribution to the world of computer science. Um, either it's with research or um, or the uh, professional world. Um, so we decided to open a local chapter here at Salem State um, just to create some kind of bridge between Salem State students and uh, and the world of computer science. Uh, it will benefit us in, in different ways. Um, if we decide to go to grad school afterwards, uh, we can just um, apply and it has a very good effect in our uh, curriculum. Or if we either go to the professional world, um, you know, we can, we can as a portfolio, we, we will have several projects that we'll be doing in um, workshops and you can uh, introduce them as your portfolio. So it will be beneficial. So computer science. Uh, computer science has grown to be a field that is integrated in almost every other field, uh, with, whether it's medical field or any kind of engineering. Um, any, in almost any other field is using some kind of software or hardware that's related to computer science. Um, so what is what is computer science at the core? Um, either I know that there are many other ways of uh, defining computer science, but one of the core things I would say is, as a computer scientist, we solve problems. Um, in, in any field, uh, if, we, if, we, if we see um, computer science is solving some kind of problem, but it's not just solving a problem, it's, uh, we're, our main goal is to solve problems more efficiently. Um, come up, in, in, whether it's with uh, different algorithms or different hardware, uh, basically um, get the things that we used to do in a different way, in a new way that's more efficient, um, we spend less time on it and get better results. Um, and we, use, we can use different versions and we can use different algorithms. Uh, one of the examples that I like is actually a professor from the, David Mellon. He's a professor at Harvard University. He uses with the phone books. I couldn't find the phone books, so I just grabbed the Java book. Um, so he said, back in the day, we had telephones, right? And these telephones were pretty static. They didn't have memory or any kind of um, way to store contacts in it. And if we decide to look up a person, uh, we, we would get a phone book and start looking and turning pages one by one. And let's say we are looking for uh, Mike Smith. Uh, we'll just go literally page by page. One, is Mike sit here? No. Another one, another one, another one. And it's guaranteed that eventually we will reach Mike Smith if he's in the book. Uh, how long would it take? We don't know. It, it might take a very long time, but it's guaranteed that we'll reach him. But it's not the most efficient way of solving this problem. Uh, what would be more uh, efficient way to solve this problem? With human mind, uh, we can, you know, relate things and open somewhere towards the end and stuff. But computer-wise, uh, in a in a mathematically, uh, how we could solve this problem is open it on the middle, right? If we open it in the middle, and we know that this book is sorted um, alphabetically, so we look: Are we in S section? No. If we are not on S section, is the S to the right or left of the um, where we are open? If it's to the right, we can just take and rip the book in half and literally throw the other half away. So we have, we have um, decreased the problem in half uh, and we only left with half of what we had before. So the problem again, again we open in half, uh, we look, are we still uh, to the left or right of S? If we are other part of the list, we can go ahead and rip it again and we will go and do that uh, continuously until we reach that one page where uh, Mike Smith is. So uh, that's much more efficient way of solving problems. So um, when we're talking about solving problems more efficiently, uh, our main topic in this, uh, in this workshop, which is mobile application development, is another example of solving problems more efficiently, right? Why there was a need to actually invent cell phones. And then once we invented cell phones, we could have talked why there was a need to put an internet in it. Once we had an internet in it, why there was a need to come up with the GPS functionality. All these uh, improvements and inventions were some kind of way of solving problems uh, efficiently because first we wanted to find restaurants um, 
we could have looked them in the book, but then if we were too lazy to look them in the book, we just wanted to find them on the go while we were driving or while we were walking in the street. So um, we, now we can just get out our uh, iPhones or um, whatever kind of other phone they use and just look up the restaurant or food or I don't know, car shop, or whatever we're looking for right on the go. So that's much more efficient way of solving this problem. And how much more efficient ways are we going to have? Um, this kind of never stops. Things get improved. Um, there's always more efficient way. We just need some more time to come up with it. So um, when we're talking about um, mobile applications, there are, there are different types of mobile applications, right? And there are web apps and there are native apps. And just to get the things going, um, I'm, I'm just going to ask you, point out a couple differences as you understand what would be the differences between web apps and native apps. Anyone? The web apps require the, the use of internet, native would be with uh, resources besides internet. Yeah, exactly, right? Uh, this is actually one of the big catches um, which, is, um, which works against web apps. Web apps, in order to use web apps, we need a continuous internet connection, right? Because our application doesn't actually lie on our phone, it lies somewhere on the server that we need to contact to, um, to, to, to use this app. So web apps need continuous um, internet connection versus native app. Native app just lies on our phone, and whenever we need it, whether we have an internet connection or not, we can just pull it up and open. Um, so that's that's one uh, point. What are the others? So uh, native apps is something that goes through the compiling process, right? Na native app is something that we write. Um, uh, if if we are de developing an iPhone application, we write on Objective C. If we write on um, um, Android, we write on Java, and then we compile this code to the object code to run on the on the machine. Um, so this gives us some advantages on the native app. We can we can access to the core of the machine, right? Uh, the um, iPhones and Android devices have these functionalities, like you can shake them, um, and it will give us some advantages, uh, like refreshing the page or something. Uh, they have GPS capabilities, uh, they have camera, and many, many other features that device actually has itself. And native, has, uh, native apps gives us this full functionality to those. Uh, web apps, when it came out at the beginning, they didn't have much access to it, but now it's growing day by day. Now we can access GPS functionalities, and sometimes there, there um, other players come in, uh, like um, we were talking about Mike, and there's a PhoneGap. PhoneGap is a product that's uh, developed by uh, Adobe, if I'm not mistaken. So it plays some kind of third guy. Um, you write a web application and then by using PhoneGap, it wraps it around it and kind of wires think that it will run on the actual device and it will access the inner uh, capabilities of the device. So um, that's another, that's another um, advantage. Um, what, what is, okay, advantage of having a web app? And it's probably one of the biggest advantages. It's, um, it's cross-platform. And this is one of the biggest advantages that we have for the web app. Uh, we just write one application and we can run it on iPhone, Blackberry, uh, Android devices versus native apps. If you're actually writing a native app, we have to write a different application for iPhone and then we have to go and apply this whole technologies using different uh, source code and different algorithms to write the same app on a Android device which uses Java and then Blackberry uses Java, but in a different way. So um, we have to deal with all these, um, if headaches or if not, um, we have to deal with all these. Versus if we can just write an application using HTML5 and um, whether it's like Java, things like JavaScript, uh, we can use Ajax and we can use PHP um, to put logic in our application, and we can just write a web app that will run um, in all these devices. Now the um, Web app doesn't have the look and feel of a native app. First of all, there, as even if it's like not that much, there's a cliche of having your own button on the iPhone to click, and it's my app. Uh, but now there are bookmarks, right? You can you can bookmark a certain page. It will create an uh, it will create a button on your iPhone or Android device. So we can we can bookmark uh, native apps like that, uh, web apps like that. 
uh, and then we can customize the button so that it will look like a native app. But inside the application, still we will not get the feeling of native app. Um, Whether there's transitions, we will see flickering screens and things loading on the page. So these are all the things that we have to consider when we make a decision if we want to de develop a native app or if we want to develop a mobile uh, web app. Uh, so there are a lot of trades, uh, and it's getting better and better, and there are frameworks out there that we can use. Uh, PhoneGap was uh, one of the frameworks. Um, so this is, a, this is a, one example of the uh, uh, application. Um, who, can you tell whether it's a web app or native app? Web. Web app. Exactly. Um, even though this looks a little bit like a native app, this is actually a web app, and it, it's done by the folks at MIT. Um, and it looks just like a native app, right? It has nice um, buttons over there. Uh, it doesn't have uh, one of the biggest things that distincts web app from a native app is usually when we see the browser tab up there, we say, oh, this is web app. But we don't even see the browser uh, tab and things like that. But this is actually a web app, just nicely done by the uh, MIT folks. And it uses things like JavaScript. They've made a bunch of icons on uh, Photoshop and used it over here. Um, so uh, this is one example of it. The other example is if you have ever used Gmail on your phone, um, and this is exactly how Gmail looks on the phone, but one of the things that we, we might pay an attention to is we don't write in a different domain name or URL uh, to go to this version of the phone, right? The application, right? We just go to the browser and type Gmail. And then if we are on the mobile phone, it brings us to this page. If we are on the desktop, it takes us to an absolutely different page. So the question that pops up is how do these browser, how do these actually, either it's browser or a server or whatever, know that we are accessing the device from, um, from a mobile phone or from a, from a desktop and how do they decide which version to display and how do they do it? So we will see those techniques over here. So, um, let's see. So uh, how many of you guys have heard things like, um, a, you know, how, how does, and well, actually first thing first, how many of you guys have ever done web development or at least made any kind of website? So uh, when the, the thing that web, uh, websites work is we know that uh, when we type in the URL and hit enter, that means we're making a request to the server, right? Uh, and when we make a request to the server, it turns out that there are a lot of things happening on the background. And what we do is we send the request. We send the request to the her her server and then we get a response. And during the request and response, there's a lot of information sharing between our browser and a web server. So if you look at that, uh, so let's look at the tools. So it turns out, guys at Google has done a really good job with uh, Chrome, uh, making it, developing tools so useful that we can see a lot of uh, information. And if you're doing any kind of mobile application or <clears throat> web development or something, this is one of the essential things to have in order to you know, boil down into our website and actually if there are any bugs, to find the bugs or you know, solve problems more efficiently. Um, so let's say we, um, we go to the page yahoo.com. So when we go to the yahoo.com, we see that there's a bunch of things happening here, and these are all the requests that our, uh, our browser is making to the Yahoo server. And if we pay attention, this thing continuously, see, the, even the page has rendered, this thing, transfer thing moves. It, it gets bigger and bigger continuously. Even though we, we, we see everything that's on the page, this is kind of moving. Um, so that's one thing that we're gonna come to. Uh, this is one way of solving problems efficiently. Uh, we don't wanna we don't wanna put too much things on the website so that it, it loads a long long time. We we wanna render our page as soon as possible, and the things that we need later on, we wanna uh, asynchronously load them on the background. So this is one example of that. But right now, what I wanted to show you guys most was the um, that information. So. <coughs> 
first request was done to the yahoo.com and if we click on it there are things that are headers um, so what is headers and this is the information that our browser has sent to the yahoo server um, that where this request is coming from and if you look at the user agent it says something like Mozilla, AppleKit, and Chrome. So it turns out that these two browsers are using a browser um, which is an open source platform. It's called WebKit, um, WebKit family. So um, you see, like we can see WebKit here. So it kind of tells the server that request is coming from this kind of browser, and um, and then the server decides to um, render the page based on this. So if if we make the request from things like um, iPhone or um, or any other device mobile application, it's gonna kind of tell them that we have, this request is coming from an iPhone or um, or a Google device, an Android device, or such. So um, that's another thing. Um, let's go back to the presentation here. So, um, what does it take to build a web application? Um, so, towards the um, our course, um, we will we will first be talking about the web applications, and then we will go into the Android. I wish we would, could have talked about the iPhone development as well. We won't have uh, a lot of time to talk about the iPhone, and uh, and also the in order to iPhone develop an application on iPhone, we need the Mac. Um, and we need to pay the developers fee, and so we didn't have that opportunity. So we just kind of uh, focus on the web application part, and then Android. Uh, so in order to make a web application, all we have to um, at the beginning, at the simplest level, know is HTML5. Uh, so and this is a this is a one version of HTML. Uh, HTML5 has done uh, a lot of improvements. Uh, if you have done any kind of application development, web development before, you know that there are many versions before HTML5. Uh, XHTML being the um, previous version. So this has much simplified doc type. Uh, XHTML doc type is I've done web development for five six years and I could have never remember what was XHTML doc type. It was some huge long thing, including very difficult to remember uh, characters. But HTML5 has just a doc type that says HTML. And um, if we can pay attention, uh, we have um, elements, and um, every part has an opening tab and a uh, closing tab. So that's the way to distinct um, on the HTML5. This is the body, this is the head. And inside the body, we'll have another element that will be a header, um, main part where we put our um, website or application, footer where we basically provide some maybe useful links or privacy policy, things like that. So this is um, one example of a simple HTML page. And then um, in order to add a favor to our page, uh, we can add things, uh, more flavorish kind of things to make it look better, to make it act better, to make transitions better. We can add things like called JavaScript and um, styling. Um, how many of you guys have heard things like CSS? Okay, uh, CSS is kind of styling that we put on the website, right? And JavaScript is um, to put some kind of logic in our um, in our code if we have to make a decision, um, basically conditional things. Or if this is happening, do this. If this is not happening, do this. Or um, we can put for loops that will iterate through our some kind of code and uh, display something uh, on a like repeated basis. So these are the things that we can add. But now when we add this, we pay some kind of price for it, right? Uh, it has advantages, but it also has disadvantages. And what are the disadvantages? Can any of you guys point out at least one or two disadvantages of these things? One of the disadvantages is these things kind of has to download, right? So when we, when we go to this website, it kind of reads from top to bottom. And these things need to be downloaded so that our website renders. So that kind of makes our website come up late if we have a loading bar, it will keep loading until these things downloaded. And this is a little bit frustrating, right? Users get bored and like, oh, this is taking a long time. So we don't want to overload our web page with all kinds of JavaScripts and styling sheets. And we want to just display just right. And what is just right? Things that are just needed to display that website. And then we saw on the Yahoo server when we made a request that things were transferring after we, have, we had the page loaded. That, those are the techniques that we want to use um, 
so that we load things on the background after we have rendered and at least display the user and page. So there are common techniques, uh, there, there are many other ways of um, techniques to do those things. And this was um, one of the things that Google has used for their own page. Uh, and there is a URL back here about this blog post if you want to read uh, more detail. But what this does is basically it declares some kind of function that loads file and then um, it takes a URL, it creates a script variable, and what it does, it um, goes, document is our page, and gets element head. Head is what we have inside our page, their header, footer. So the element that has an ID head, it takes that and appends the script to that. What happens is it loads the, um, that URL that we have provided asynchronously. This was a pretty good way of solving that problem previously, but then there are things like Ajax and such, that came out and they're probably more clear way of solving these problems. So now there's a better version um, of solving these problems. And um, have any of us heard things of Ajax? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Ajax, what is Ajax? Ajax is basic, basically an XML uh, HTTP request, we call it. Uh, it's a request that we make to the server and we get a response back and we load that response to the certain part of the page without having uh, without having to reload the whole page, right? So it's a way kind of to add a dynamism to our website. It's basically almost all the most famous websites are using now um, to kind of do things dynamically. So this is the way of solving that problem uh, with Ajax. What we have again is we have some kind of function that loads file, and inside that function we have another function that's called the callback function. Now that, what this does is it says make a request to the server and once you get the response back, if the response number is four and the, um, and the, um, if the state is four and the status is 200, and we'll look at that in a little bit what those means. 200 means it's good, right? When we get a request from server, they're 409, I don't know, 200. So 200 means that I've made a request to the server and I got a good response back, everything works fine. And state means that it depends, like uh, Ajax has different states. Uh, it has when I open a connection, when, I'm, when I request a connection, when I'm waiting for a result, when I got the result, and when I loaded the file. So it has different states. And four is one of those states where we load everything. So if we say, if we are on state four and the request is 400, go ahead and evaluate this response text. And what it does is it says, um, when the state ready state change call back and close that function and it says evaluate this thing open the URL via get and this true means here do it asynchronously right don't hold back for certain minutes or sometimes do it asynchronously so what this does is at the same time when we render our page it it goes ahead and loads the things that we need on the background and so this is very um, dynamic way of solving this problem we will get these things more deeply towards the um, later of our lecture. Um, so I just want to point out a couple of things. So um, again, uh, at the beginning of the lecture, I mentioned things like a phone gap and um, and things like that. That they're third-party guys. So they're frameworks, right? What these frameworks provide is um, some kind of functionality that we can use. And as a computer scientist, we know that. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. We don't want to do everything from the beginning, right? We want to make use of the things that have been made to us available previously. Um, so these are frameworks that are made us to available. And um, throughout our workshop, we'll probably be using jQuery Mobile, but you're welcome to explore any of them and uh, look at them. So what these frameworks does is they kind of play a role in between you and the device, and they wire things that. Um, you write your application, they take a certain command and, um, and introduce that to the device. Uh, so we get better functionality, we can access things like a GPS, we can access things like a, a camera and such. So um, PhoneGap is uh, one of the probably famous ones that have been done by the uh, Adobe. Uh, so uh, we know that like for example Java application, before Java World we had um, applications that we could run on PCs, but we couldn't run them on Mac. Right, uh, or we could we had like map um, applications that we could run on app, but we couldn't run on uh, PC. And this Java came into the world, and they offered things like JVM, right? 
JVM is something that runs on the background, and we write one application, we compile it one, and we can run it simultaneously. So this kind of in a little bit moving towards that, it's not really JVM kind of thing, but it, it kind of like introduces a third party who can play a role in between our code and the device. So these are the frameworks like that. We will talk more towards the uh, middle of the lecture. So um, let's see. Uh, after our lecture, once we are done with the web application development, we will go ahead and develop one application. Uh, and then, uh, I don't know if you guys want to do it like more like an independently and then like discuss it at the workshop or we want to do it all together, we'll probably vote on it. And if we want to do it all together, we can just do it all together here or we, you can do it at home and then we can discuss it here. So what is mobile local? We will develop an application that we will go to the certain website and we will probably provide you uh, the place where you can load your files and. Uh, save it on our server. Um, so we got to go to the certain website and it's going to ask us uh, basically a text box and it says enter your location, right? We will enter either a zip code or a city and then once we hit enter it will provide us the news and the weather from that location. Uh, we probably want to also have a button that will detect our location so that we won't have to enter our location. We'll be like, oh, just get my current location. Uh, we will press that button and then it will go ahead and give us the news and the weather for the location that where we are. Um, so that will be the first uh, application that we will write. Uh, and then um, you can actually go out of your way and add a flavor to it by adding cool JavaScripts and CSS. And if, if you do really good application that will be impressible, we can, uh, we can host it on our website as an ACM so that you can provide it if you're applying to any kind of jobs or anything, you can apply it as a portfolio and they can view. Uh, and you can get a recommendation from ACM. So um, that's one advantage of uh, doing that. After HTML5, we will move towards the Android, right? We'll talk, and first application is like in every programming class, Hello World. We'll go ahead and set things up and just run Hello World application. And after Hello World, we will probably have something that you can choose your own. Um, that's I think better approach that you can you can uh, introduce new ideas that what kind of application you would want to develop as an Android and we will see if, if it's doable we'll advise you to do that and then we can discuss things um, on the go so that you can get your application up and running. Um, what kind of advantages this would have? Um, when you become a senior student um, there are things like you have to do senior projects uh, so if you, if you go ahead and develop something good, uh, you can probably toward, develop it more towards your senior project, so you will have your senior project ready. Um, or it, some kind of portfolio that you can provide your employers. Um, so those are the advantages. So, um, so one thing I want to point out, uh, this these website, these uh, slides that are being used, uh, they're, they're coming from the source of Harvard University. They actually copyrighted to uh, Professor David Mellon and Dan Armandaris. And you're welcome to use them, you're welcome to download them, you're welcome to share them as long as you don't provide them as your own. Just respect the author rights and act responsibly. And uh, I want to thank to Professor Mellon for making this available uh, so that you know we can all uh, benefit from that. Uh, so, go to that slide. So for the Android part of the course, um, this probably will be one of the most go-to places for us, right? Uh, any kind of um, advice, suggestion, uh, documentation that we need, we will uh, refer to this website here, developer.android.com. Uh, this is the um, very nice documented uh, web page that's provided by um, Google. Um, so Android works a little bit different. Uh, we know that. Uh, uh, it's a, it uses Java code, but um, when we compile it, there are extra steps happens. So when we, we know that when we do Java, actually, um, we compile our code and it runs on the um, Java virtual machine. What uh, what Android does is that there's a thing that is called Dalwig. So uh, that Dalwig is a different kind of way of um, running the uh, application. So we don't want to deal with all these inner steps, like um, basically, it turns out you can actually write an Android application without using any IDE. 
right? You can you can write in on a text editor like Notepad plus plus or just regular Notepad, and then you can run it on your command prompt and just you know make everything ready and package it up using any kind of zip archive thing. It will be ready, but that's too much headache. We're gonna use Eclipse. Uh, where Eclipse is going to take care of all the middle steps for us. So we're going to just write a Java code and get an application out of it. So um, Eclipse is one of the tools that we will be referring to. And another thing we'll be using is an uh, emulator. Emulator is something that we can test our um, application once we do. So it turns out emulator is good, but not it doesn't support many uh, uh, functionalities. We know that our phone has things like camera, uh, has things like USB connection or like shaking capabilities and stuff. So these are the things that emulator will not support. So if you go ahead and make an application that you will use some kind of uh, camera functionality, we're not going to be able to test them on the emulator. Emulator is still a good place to test a most chunk of your code, but if you, if you use any of these uh, functionalities, just be informed that emulator is not going to support it. And it's good to have an actual device you can you can test them on. So if you have any kind of Android device, you can deploy your application to your device and test them fully on your device. So um, this is the statistics of Android. Uh, let just refer to a more updated version. This, oh yeah, this is much better. This is from October 1st. Um, so um, one of the disadvantages of Android has versus iPhone is um, is that it has a lot of versions. It has many other versions, and uh, a lot of people are using one version, and some people are using the other version. So it's kind of trade-off to make, right? When you make an Android application, what version we want to develop for. So it's kind of good to check the statistics, see what is the biggest usage of the Android version. Uh, turns out, as of October 1st, 2012, uh, Gingerbread is the one that's being used, and I think it's 2.3. Yeah, 2.3 Gingerbread is about 55% of the whole market. Uh, back in May, um, Gingerbread was about, I think, 70%. Uh, but one of the biggest growth we have seen is the ice cream sandwich. Ice cream sandwich has grown, so these are the things that we have to think about. But gingerbread doesn't really support a lot of good features that ice cream does. Ice cream is a lot of latest, one of the latest versions. Um, it has cool UI features and cool widgets and stuff. So it depends. Do we want to use all these cool widgets or do we want to reach out to more people. So these are the things that we have to think about when we decide what version we want to um, make an application for. Now we have to also know that if we develop for gingerbread, it's also going to run in all the latest platforms. It's going to run, it's going to be supported in ice cream sandwich, uh, jelly bean, and etc. But if we develop an application for ice cream sandwich, it might not run as well in gingerbread as it does on ice cream sandwich. So these are the decisions that we have to make and look at when we uh, develop an application for the Android device. So HTML5. HTML5 is one of the probably biggest uh, developments that has done into HTML. Um, it's, it's, it's done by the two uh, major guys in the market, and one of them is WC3. Uh, we will refer to their websites a lot um, in order to use hints or things that we want to make. Um, so, um, turns out, sometimes I'm going to act like I don't know anything in web development and what we're going to do is we're going to develop a website uh, solely referring to Google. We will search things, how does it get done, how do we do this, and we will put things together so that uh, we will see how we can make use of all these resources that are out there. And WC3 is one of the good resources that we can look at. Uh, so HTML5, just because it's so good and you know it offers a lot of advantages, Guys who developed HTML5, they decided to make the logo like a Superman shield, kind of, you know, show that we are Superman in the HTML world. And they went ahead and uh, added all these uh, icons, cool icons, to the uh, parts that HTML5 is using. And there's a lot of new things in HTML5, in semantics, in CSS3 is one of them, multimedia and storage. We will look at these individually, every one of them. Uh, turns out that HTML5 actually supports local storage. We can do some kind of functionality that 
we can request some kind of data, store it locally on the computer, and then access that data whenever we want. This is a really cool feature because it adds, um, it saves us the um, trip that we have to make to the server every time we need any kind of data. We can store it locally on our computer and we can just generate it or get it whenever we need it. Um, so it, it, it turns out it's a faster way of solving stuff. We get much more access to the memory, and etc. CSS3 also offers a lot of new things. Um, so basically, we, we can add a lot of new functionalities that make our websites look much better, uh, much better. And then there's a multimedia. Um, before, HTML didn't really support video. And if we needed any kind of video, uh, we would probably have to refer things like flash players and uh, embed things from YouTube or something. Now, <coughs> HTML5 actually supports video. So that's probably one of the biggest advantages. Um, because when we make an application, we probably want to have some kind of video in it um, to, to provide maybe, I don't know, step-by-step -step instructions or something. Uh, so that's been a good advantage of HTML5. Uh, so these are, uh, and it, it has a lot of new things, connectivity, it, you can access device, you can access performance features, and these are continuously growing, right? These are continuously, we, we can access more and more uh, by latest improvements to the device's inner part. Uh, but mostly we will talk about the storage and then device access. We will not go into others as much. Uh, so let's look at some examples down here. Uh, let's see. All right, so these are two pages, right? And uh, I'm going to switch from tab to tab, and uh, we don't really see much difference in between these two pages. They're almost identical, um, but they're actually uh, different at the core. So let's look at the XHTML one first. Uh, this is the previous version of HTML. Uh, it has um, two basically tags that um, provide us some kind of article. An article has a title, it has a date, and it has a body and then it has a title up top and it has some links. But if you look at the source code, okay. So if you look at the uh, source code of the thing actually, um, those things that we actually saw, there are a bunch of div tags. There's a footer that's a div tag, there's a body, the one post is a div tag, another post is a div tag, and then we have a navigation for a div tag. And then there's a header for a div tab. And um, basically, that's one of the uh, kind of things that previous versions of HTML thing had. There are div tags this all over the place. And um, there, sometimes this doesn't make sense because there's some kind of static things that we don't want to have div tags. The, there's a functionality like an article. We just want to have a tag that's article that kind of pro provides us the functionality of a date and a title and things like that. So those are the things that you know uh, makes difference when it comes to um, HTML5. Also, these things like a header, uh, footer. Now, it turns out that div tags support things like uh, classes and IDs. We can provide them IDs. So if we have a header, we can put a div tag and put a header ID. If we have a footer, we can put a footer ID. But still, that's a little bit of confusion. So if you look at the uh, HTML5 version of the um, same thing. We can kind of see a much cleaner version uh, that it has direct tags that are actually a header. So it has a header tag, and inside the header tag, there is a nav tag which supports a navigation, and it has a tag like an article. Um, so that's that's one of the posts that we saw. An article has a basically way of, we can put a header, and then it has a time tag, and this is a really cool. Uh, functionality because it comes really useful <coughs> for the crawlers. Um, we know that there are a lot of web crawlers out there and they come into our uh, website to fetch data. So we can provide them uh, the way that actually they fetch data and then provide the data in a format that we actually want to display to the user. So all these things become very handy when it comes to the HTML5.
So one of the things that I want to talk about is um, CSS. Um, so what is CSS? It's a way to style our website. And if we think about it in a, in a real world, it's kind of clothing that we put it on the website, right? So um, like we saw, uh, when we go to the uh, Gmail or when we go to the MIT.edu, when we access, when we access to that site uh, from, uh, from a mobile device, it gives us a different version. When we access that device from a desktop, it gives us a different version. So does that mean that this website has two absolutely different implementations that picks which one to display? And what would be the answer? Is that yes or no? No, exactly. Because um, it would not make sense to make two different Gmail websites fully just to display the mobile version and the desktop version, right? It turns out that there's only one version that has made, but it has different coding, and which is, um, that's when the CSS comes in. It has a different style, and the website, based on the request you make, your browser tells the server, this request is coming from a mobile phone, like an iPhone, or this request is coming from a, a desktop, and then the server decides which version to display, and that's when the CSS comes in. So it's like a CSS, it's like a clothing. Um, when we go to the business meeting, we put a business suit, right? And when we go to the casual meeting, we put a casual suit. That doesn't make a different person. We are still the same person, just look different. And uh, when we see a dirty person, it's the odds are we can probably make him look better just by changing his clothing, right? So that's exactly like when we, when we have websites that doesn't really look good, we can probably change around CSS and make that website look okay. But when we see a person that is sick, they probably go through some kind of x-ray and they go to the doctor and they actually have to take their clothes off to show what's wrong with their body. That's when we go digging into the HTML part, when we dig into the code. If we have bugs on the website, we, wanna, we don't want to look at the CSS, we want to look at the code to figure out the bugs. So this website is something that doesn't have anything styling or anything um, associated with it. It's just pure HTML website and it has two uh, paragraphs. Uh, so when we apply CSS to this thing, um, we can have this version out here. So this is exactly the same, right? This, these two websites are exactly the same, but they don't look same. And it turns out that this one has CSS associated with it and the other one doesn't. But this is a decision that we have to make. When we apply to the website, when we look at this website on a desktop, we know that we have much larger space. When we have much larger space, we want to display as much information as we can. That's why we put these paragraphs side by side. But would this be a good design idea if we access this website via cell phone? Probably not, right? What would we want to do if we access to this website via cell phone? We probably want to put these up on top of one another so that you know user doesn't have to scroll to the right, read, zoom in, pinch in, zoom in, read the, uh, this part of the website and then scroll to this side, read this part of the website. So it turns out that it's better way to display this thing on a cell phone is to access it, to put it up top to bottom. So if we actually look at it on the iPhone simulator, So here, okay, you see, these things are top to bottom. So this is a better version of the previous one. So if you look at the index one on the iPhone simulator, we cannot read anything, right? Especially if we are on a small device, we cannot read anything. So it turns out that this CSS actually has a fixed width and height, and depending on that width and height, it kind of checks it with the device and renders the width and height with the width and height of the device, and that's why we have all this empty space around here. So this is not really a good design decision when it comes to the mobile application development. We probably want to change this around, and that's the, one of the major differences between the cell phone devices and the desktop devices. Desktop devices we had, the width is bigger than the height, but the mobile applications, mobile web devices are basically, we have a bigger uh, height than a width. So we want to make a different design decision. That's where the the second uh, version comes in, right? Let's see. So this is where the second version comes in. 
But this is still not very readable, right? If you look at the device, you're not going to be able to read it. Better than the previous one, but not the most perfect one. Uh, so we kind of have to zoom in again. So that's why we, we want to provide some kind of functionality that actually detects the device and based on the device width, gives us more readable format. So we'll look at the version of that. So if you look at, this is index two. So if you go ahead and look at index three, we won't see much difference on the desktop. It's just like index two on the, uh, on the, just like the previous one we saw, right? But if we actually go to the iPhone and look at the version, this is much more readable, right? So this is much more readable, and this is where actually we use that functionality that detects the device width and displays out the version that we can actually read. We can just scroll and read. So if you look at the source code over here, we will we will see that on the top we have given this, and that that's just a small fix by just providing one line. So there's a lot of people that makes this web application without knowing this fix, and they become annoying to read the things. And if they actually look for it, it's just one line of code that makes such a big difference. By providing this line, we tell the basically um, server that basically render the page based on the device width. So and that that fixes the whole thing. So we'll we'll go look at two more examples of providing better functionalities. Uh, let's look at four here. So these are different CSS versions that we can actually. Um, Add, right? CSS supports things like gradients, we can add gradient backgrounds, we can add round corners and stuff. Now, these are not fully supported with the previous browsers. So what we want to do is when we actually provide these things, we want to check. We want to check with the uh, browser if it's supported. And if it's supported, we want to use this version. If it's not supported, we want to use other versions. And especially, like I mentioned at the beginning, um, Firefox, Chrome, and Safari turns out that they use a WebKit browser family, and WebKit is an open, open uh, source platform, um, and basically most of the devices support, and all the Android and iOS devices, they sub fully support WebKit functionalities, so you don't have to worry about that, but if you're using any kind of device that kind of uses uh, Internet Explorer, especially the previous versions, you're not going to get all these cool, um, cool functionalities. So we want to check it. Based on our aliens, we want to check things. Uh, so if you look at source code here. So these are these are all the all the things that we can actually do with CSS on HTML5. We can do things like we can rotate the pages. We can um, we can do cool effects and stuff. Not that these are very useful, but these are just something to keep in mind that we can do all kinds of tricks with CSS. Um, uh, this would actually become very annoying if we use these things a lot, but sometimes they can be useful. So one of the core things that we were talking about is to actually detect the device, right? And look at, let's look at a couple of things. Let's look at HDF index 5. So it turns out that this is the exact same thing, same URL that I'm uh, trying to reach both on a desktop and on a mobile phone. But it displays two different versions. It displays absolutely different on a desktop version. If we have two columns side by side, and on the, on the mobile version, we have one on top of the other one. So how do they do this? Um, how do we actually detect how, what version of the device we're using? Um, so if you look at that source code over here, We actually have three different links, right? And this, these are three different CSS, and we can actually see we have a desktop version of the CSS, and we have a mobile mobile version of the CSS. 
and based on the media type where we detect with the screen resolution that's trying to access to the server, uh, we decide what version are we using. Are we using a desktop or are we using a mobile phone? So it turns out this is not really the good way of detecting. It still does detect it, but it's not the perfect way of detecting because um, these devices are improving day by day and they're getting to have different device weights and their different uh, resolutions. So sometimes we will get errors with this version. So there are better versions of accessing this thing and we can look at the uh, sex. So the sex version is again um, shows us different on the um, desktop and different on the iOS device. It's top to bottom one. And if you look at the source code, it detects the device differently. It detects the device by using some kind of script. And it turns out, like I mentioned before, when we make a request to the server, our, um, our device, our browser, includes some kind of things that are called on the header file on the request. And it kind of tells the browser this request is coming from an iPhone or Android device. Uh, so what this script does is basically tells that if this script is coming from iPhone or Android device, go ahead and render this website based on the mobile uh, version. If it's coming from a uh, desktop computer, then go ahead and render based on the desktop CSS. So this is again, this is a pretty good um, way of determining, especially better than um, the previous uh, version. But what is the bug here? What this will not do? Um, we're checking for Android and iPhone, but there's so many other cell phones out there. there there's uh, BlackBerry devices, there are, there are Windows devices, so this is not going to detect it for all of them. So we can find a better version, um, and let's look at index A. So this index 8 again renders two versions of this website, but if I look at the source code over here, I will not see any logic. It just says desktop. I got an example over here. So these are again two different versions of one accessed on the cell phone and one accessed on the desktop. So these are the um, cool features that HTML provides us to make a web application. So. If you look at the example, there's things like give us a call. It's a button that basically says give us a call. And it's a button that sends us a uh, text message, send all of us text. And there are input places where we can enter uh, uh, email addresses or cell phone numbers and stuff. Now, when we look at this um, on a desktop, it doesn't really make that big of a difference. Uh, since like when I click over here, it's just going to let me provide some kind of input. Uh, and when I click this button, nothing is going to happen because there's not really a this calling functionality associated this, with this website over here. Uh, but if you look at this on a cell phone, uh, when we actually access this thing on our device and when we click on this, give us a call, it's going to take us to that page where it says, give us a call. Now, it's not supported over here on the simulator, but you can actually see that it actually made a request to the core of the phone. Just because simulator doesn't support it, it tells us that Safari cannot open the page, but it, it does support. Or when, when we actually click on the things like send us a text, it again, it uh, accesses the core of the page. Uh, and the things with the email, so this is a standard input thing. When we click on that, we see that this thing popped up, right? This is a keyboard where we can put some kind of text. Now, if we go ahead and click on the other one, this is email, and we saw that the thing changed, right? We got the add button over here, button, the dot here. So these are the things that we need for the email. And then we can go ahead, and this is the URL input. If I click on the URL input, this again changes for the com, and um, it gives us, again, the keyboard functionality and stuff. So how does this browser actually know that I'm trying to type a URL or email or just the standard text, and based on that, it divides us it provides us this input. So if you look at the source code over here,
So we can see that there, those links are actually here. Uh, this is a link that uh, actually tries to access the cell phone uh, functionality, the calling functionality of the uh, device. This is the things that are trying to uh, access the messaging functionalities of the EMAS uh, device. And there are the regular input uh, boxes, these are just standard input boxes, but there's also the input boxes that are type of email. So this is when we, by just basically providing this, we can access that feature where it gives us that uh, email tag. So these are all the very useful tags that really make it comfortable on the user end. And there are things that um, people, for the people who have used iPhone, uh, I didn't use Android device, but I used iPhone, and autocorrect was one of the most frustrating things for me when I'm typing an email or something. Um, especially with the international language, you write something on your language and it automatically com converts it to some kind of English that doesn't really make sense. So we can actually turn autocorrect off with just providing this uh, functionality here. And autocomplete also can be turned off. Um, capitalizing can be turned off. So these are HTML5 supports, all kinds of functionalities that are actually very useful when we, uh, when we go ahead and um, develop an application for the mobile phone. Um, so this is one of the last slides that I was going to go. Now on the next lectures, we'll go into things like JSON. What is JSON? It's, it's a JavaScript object notation, and it turns out it's a way that um, we get a, we make a request. And um, for our projects that I mentioned, that we're going to make a project that uh, we will have an input where we put in the location, and then based on the location, it pulls the news uh, and weather um, for our location. It turns out there's sites out there, and there's sites like um, Google News. Google News is a way, um, they kind of syndicate the news. So if they're syndicating the news, there's some way of accessing that news and pulling the data out from them and then provide on our own website. We'll see how we do that on our project. And um, and there's a, turns out we cannot make a direct request from our website to different servers. Um, we'll talk about that on the next lecture. Uh, but what we can do is we can, there's a equal, uh, I actually don't know how to pronounce it, it's YQL, it's called the Yahoo Query language. So by, the, by using Yahoo Query language, what we can do is provide them with some kind of URL that they access to the Google News for us, they pull out the Google News and uh, give us the information. So if I'm not mistaken, I think the, um, let's see, the address was Yeah, okay, this worked. Uh, so this is the way of uh, pulling the Google News for Salem, Massachusetts. And you saw that I actually integrated the uh, zip code at the URL. So if we go to the bottom of the Google page, it will provide us RSS. And if you look at the RSS, this is basically the way that Google gives us to take this page and render on our website. And we can take this thing and break them into parts and we have provided with the things like a title and then URL, and basically there are item one, item two, item three, that gives us all the news. So what we're gonna do on our project is we, we're gonna take this page and we're gonna render on our website and basically display the user um, what are the news for the location we have entered. So basically this is it for this lecture. Um, on, the, on the next week lecture, we're gonna talk, go and talk more details about the JSON and uh, and how we can actually access the Yahoo uh, Quiro language and pull the data from Google and provide it on our website. Uh, but these are basically the introduction to the mobile web uh, application development. Uh, so things that you have to consider when you're making, uh, how to make a decision, whether to make a web application or native application. So we wanna, we wanna look at these things and remember that at the core of everything, it lies the uh, concept of how we wanna solve a problem and what are the strategies we have to approach to it, and how can we solve it more efficiently? That's one of the basically the most core things. So basically, that's it um, for the lecture today. Uh, we have some social time that we can go and make discussions, and there's pizza and drinks that you can go ahead and serve yourself. Thanks, everybody, for coming.